Good morning, Grove family, and welcome to early service here at the Grove. If you're here in the room or joining us online, we want to say a special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hopefully, uh, when you walked in, you were handed a bulletin, and if this is your first time with us, we want to draw your attention to the back of the bulletin where we have our Connect card. Um, we would love to connect with you while you're here on campus, and you could help us do that by filling this card out. After service, we would love to invite you over to Guest Central over here to your right. We will have a team there to welcome you. We have a small gift to say thank you for joining us. And then most of all, we'd love to hear your story. We don't want to miss out on hearing how you came to join us today. And if you're looking for a church, we would love to help you um, belong here and connect with us. So please don't let us miss out on that. Um, and then we always have important announcements inside our bulletin. Um, I would love for you to open it up if you have it in your hands. Uh, next weekend is our summer camp sponsorship weekend. This is the opportunity where we as a whole church get to partner with our student ministries and our families to help send students to camp. Um, many of the people in this church uh, were saved and their lives were changed at a summer camp. And so we want to be a church who gets to help scholarship students who maybe have financial need. So you can come and bid on things. Um, it's a silent auction next weekend. And they're still welcoming auction items if you have something that you think um, would help in their donation. So we'd love your help in that. And then secondly, today we have a special gathering called our Nations Worship Night tonight in the chapel from 5 to 7.30. The first hour is going to be a time of appetizers and fellowship. And then from 6 to 7.30, we're going to spend time praying because because if you um, are not a part of a change group, um, this whole past week in our change experience, we've been talking about the unreached people of the world. Um, I don't know if you know, but did you know there are still over 6,500 people, groups, who have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Um, and if you don't really um, capture the idea of that, Back in the ministry hallway, um, when you leave service today, we want to encourage you to go walk through the hallway because we have a wall that represents the unreached people groups of the world. Um, and when you walk by it, I think it's a, an overwhelming experience to see how many people have still not heard the name of Jesus. And we want you to see that. And then we want to invite you back so that we can pray and be difference makers in the world of bringing the gospel to the nation so that all people can know our God because he has been so kind to save us and give us purpose in that way. So those are the important things today. And then there are a few more announcements there. Um, but now it's our time to get to worship the Lord. So if you're willing and able, would you stand with us as we begin to worship our God today? Church, how are we doing this morning? Is there anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord just one more time to give glory and praise to an amazing God? Well, come on, I need your help. Let's clap our hands all over the room. Come on. Come on, let me see you, church. Hey, so wandering into the night, wanting a place to Just came. 
this morning to God for picking you up and turning you around and placing your feet on silent ground. Is there anyone thankful for the master this morning? He's a good God that we serve. And, and truthfully of the matter, our desire and our hope is to be more like him, to walk like him and to talk like him and to think like him and have our heart posture like him. And I believe one way that we can do that is to come into his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise, but also with the heart of surrender. So this morning, I would love for you to lift this song up with me as we prepare to place our hearts in surrender to him. The song simply says this, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I Every moment, every moment, every moment, Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way. Come on, sing it again, Lord, Lord, I give you my heart. We come to give him our soul this give morning. Give my soul. I live for you. I live for you. Every breath, every breath. Moment I'm away. Every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way. Have your Come on, let's fill this room with that. Lord, I give. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Every moment.
Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Father, you are holy. And so we give you reverence this morning for being holy, for being majestic, for being all powerful, all seeing, all knowing. God, we thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity and the freedom to be able to worship you, to be able to call out your name, to be able to lift our hands. God, we love you so much this morning, and we thank you for being holy. As our service continues and goes forward, and as we prepare our hearts for the word, I pray that your word will minister to us this morning, that it will prick our hearts this morning, and that it will push us further towards you. We honor your presence now. We love you, and it's in your precious son Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say amen. Amen, amen church. Hey, before you take your seats. <laughs> Before you take your seats, can you do me a favor, turn to your right, your left, front, back, greet somebody this morning and tell them, hey, how you doing? Favorite song? Bro, I love Oh, dude, it just warms my heart. All right. 8 a.m., you are my people. I love this group. Yeah, I love it. I just told Kristen, I said, like, Kristen, do you know that's my favorite song, that second worship song uh, that we sang, the old school one? Uh, anyways, he's like, he said he knew. <laughs> he said, I saw you smiling when we were singing. <laughs> oh, well, thankful that we can come together and worship our master. For some of you, you'll go home after this and watch the masters when this is done. So come to church and go and have a relaxing afternoon. Uh, but may the Lord speak to us this morning as we gather to praise him and hear from him. Uh, Damon did a great job last uh, weekend as he preached through Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 through 16 as he introduced our new series that we're calling Press On. Uh, I, I like when we're breaking through a, a book of the Bible uh, to have different series as the themes change. Uh, this will be our last series as we finish the book of Philippians. We'll end it I believe the first weekend of June, so, so about a, a month and a half left. Um, and Paul just spends a lot of time uh, talking about pressing on, as we'll even see today, continue to study chapter 3. Um, on Easter, we studied Paul's ongoing desire to know Christ. After 30 years of being a believer, Paul says, oh, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. I want to share in your sufferings that I might somehow attain to, uh, by any means possible, the resurrection of the dead. Uh, in Philippians 3, verse 12, which Damon hit on last week, Paul says, not that have I, have I already obtained this or am already perfect, but I, I press on to make it my own. So Paul's very clear with us that he is not perfect. He's very clear with us that he's still a sinner. He's pretty much telling us at this point in time, I, I, I'm a sinner. I, I still make mistakes. I have not arrived. Uh, he had this type of mindset in his life that progress was still needed to be made in his own relationship with God. Uh, and pursuit of holiness. Um, in Philippians uh, 3, we really see the passion of Paul's soul, uh, and we actually see the one thing that he focused in on. I think that's interesting. The one thing that Paul focused in on. Guy who wrote half the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But what is that one thing that we studied even last, last week? And let's look at verses 13 and 14 of chapter 3 again. Paul says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what is that one thing that he did? Could you articulate it and write it down on your notes uh, in one sentence? Well, the one thing he did, it, it was not forgetting what was behind him. That's not the one thing. That was part of the solution to help him focus in on the one thing. But the one thing he did, the one thing that Paul had on his mind, is that he pressed on toward the goal. He's pressing on towards the goal, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As you think through that, too, just the way that's written out, what is that prize? What is that goal? ESV words it this way, the prize is the fullness of blessings and reward, rewards in the age to come. So he's pressing on towards the prize, he's pressing on towards the goal, towards the blessings and the rewards in the age to come. And it wasn't just a, a gold crown that he's going to have on his head, that, that sounds uncomfortable. But for him, the prize and the reward, as the ESV continues on, says most importantly, being in perfect fellowship with Christ. 
What do you think that will be like to be in perfect fellowship with Christ in our life? To get to heaven and we have no more sin at all. To just enjoy Christ fully as we are with him. What Paul is saying in chapter 3 as we're studying this, he's saying, I don't have perfect fellowship with him yet. Now, Christ had saved Paul. Christ had redeemed Paul's life. But it's as if Paul is saying, he's still perfecting me. I, I have not attained perfection in my life. I'm pressing on towards a perfect relationship with Jesus, of which is the greatest prize in my life. Now, think about this in your life. Do you think you'll ever be perfect in your lifetime? I don't think so. I asked Natalie this last night at dinner. I said, do you think you'll ever go one full day without sinning in your life? Do you think you have gone one full day in your life without ever sinning? She's like, no, I don't think I have. That's what she told me. She Googled it. I mean, we have six, they say, they, I don't know how they know this, but 60,000 thoughts a day. I mean, good luck trying to have perfect thoughts, 60,000 of them, to have a perfect day. So it is interesting, like we're, we're supposed to, as Christians, our aim and goal is to, to be perfect, to have perfect fellowship with Jesus, and yet it's almost like we know that we're going to lose every single day. It almost is like we know that we're going to be defeated at certain points in time. But the type of mindset that we're supposed to have, I mean, even Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we have this aim, we have this goal, of like, oh, Lord, I, I want to be perfect in my relationship with you. So Paul was pressing on for perfection. The word press on in verse 12 and 14, I mean, if you're going through Philippians and you have your Bibles open, I mean, I'd even inter, I'd underline those, that word press on in verse 12 and verse 14, because that's really where the rest of this letter is, is going. The Greek word for press on is dia, diako, which means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing to run after. That's what press on means. So in a negative sense, the word press on can, can actually be translated to persecute. It's even translated that a couple times in the New Testament. Why? Because someone's pursuing after another person in a hostile manner. So you could even say that Paul pressed on and persecuted other people before knowing the Lord. And that's what he did. However, it can also mean to run a race, to go after a thing, to go after a prize, to go after a goal. Like, I'm going until I pursue this. So now, after Paul has been saved by Jesus, he's pressing on, pursuing after Jesus his prize. We're going to talk a lot about pressing on. Uh, what keeps you from pressing on in your relationship with Jesus? What, what things stop you? What, where do you feel stagnant in your relationship with him? I, I think sometimes we can become stagnant if we become overly confident in our own relationship with God. I think some people may have that mindset, I'm doing good, I'm fine, uh, nothing else I really need to do right now. So they stop pressing on and striving after Christ. I've met people like this who've been overly confident. Um, they're like, I don't even know, I don't even need to go to church. I, I went to Sunday school. I heard a lot of the stories. I don't need to read my Bible. Don't need to do any of those things. I, I'm in an okay place. But that's not the example that Paul sets for us. Once again, Paul had been a believer up to 30 years at this point in time. And he's saying, oh, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. And here's what I, I want us to really see here. Paul was not satisfied with where he was at in his relationship with God. He desired to press on all the more, which means this, that he lived with a certain discontentment in his life that he had not arrived to where he wanted to be with God. Now, that sounds weird because Jesus makes us content but what I'm saying and even arguing here is I feel this in my own heart. I'm like, Lord, I'm not where I want to be. It's a godly discontentment. It's a holy discontentment of like, I have not arrived to where I want to be. And, and just feeling that in, in our own lives, it should push us to strive and press on to be more like Christ. Uh, the type of Christ follower we're called to be is not someone who's congratulating ourselves all the time, thinking like, dude, I'm killing it. I'm doing such a good job right now in my relationship with the Lord. Where when you look at scripture and you see examples of godly, righteous people, it's not someone who's just like, I'm killing it, but it's someone who has this, oh Lord, I need you. God, I need you. I'm not where I need to be. That's what we're seeing in Paul's life. I mentioned a passage of scripture a couple weeks ago of the Pharisee and the tax collector who go to the temple. 
where the Pharisee goes to the temple and prays, oh God, thank, thank you. Thank you that I'm not like all these other evil people. Thank you that I tie. Thank you that I pray. Thank you that I do all these things. It's like he's just congratulating himself. Where the tax collector comes and says, oh, have mercy on me. God is a sinner. Like, I need you today. So as together as a church, we're looking at what does it look like to even be mature in our relationship with God? Well, I think we'll have this mindset of, I haven't arrived yet. Oh, Lord, I need your mercy today. Have mercy on me today, God, because I'm a sinner. And help me to understand your grace, your goodness, as I strive after you all the more. I mean, that's what I see. Uh, Here's a quote I put together. You want to write it down. But congratulating ourselves leads to complacency. It does. If we're just thinking I'm doing an okay job, we're confessing our shortcomings leads to commitment to press on of like, yeah, I'm, I'm not there yet here. I'm not, I'm not where I want to be. And we see this, uh, we see this with, with Paul. That's what he's modeling to us. When I think about what keeps me from pressing on in my relationship with God, it's not overconfidence. I, I don't think that's my struggle. Uh, for me, it's defeat. Um, I want to be perfect. I want to do everything right. But when I get defeated, whether it's my own sin or whether um, I'm trying to do something for the Lord, it just doesn't, doesn't work out. That's where I'm like, oh my goodness. Like I've been trying at this for years. And then it just, it doesn't feel like I'm making progress. And those are the times where I feel like I can get stagnant in my relationship with God. And I think some people will have that mindset. I feel like I keep losing. Why even try? Why even try if I know that I'm going to lose and I'm going to sin every single day? Uh, I uh, coach one of my kids' football teams. They play here at uh, the church. My buddy Stevie is the head coach. I'm the assistant coach. Uh, as of yesterday, we had not won a game. I blame him because he's the head coach. You know? <laughs> I'm just the assistant. You know? And uh, trying to pump up the team, you know, losing record, 0-3. And, and told the kids, hey, you guys here? You guys ready to win? You ready to win? And one kid said, no, we're just going to lose again. That's what he said. And I'm like, man, you can't have that mindset. I was like, appreciate your honesty, but like in sports, like you got to have the mindset, like we're going to win today. Yeah, we were terrible the first three games, but today is the day where we're going to win. And, and wouldn't you know, we won. I mean, it was, it was great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you for clapping. We needed the encouragement. <laughs> Our team needed the encouragement. Well, same thing with Christians. You can't have this mindset of like, I'm just going to lose again. Probably just going to mess up again. I tried really hard the last time, but I'm just going to mess up again. Now, we have this mindset of pressing on to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, asking for help, having the mindset of Paul that I haven't attained this, but I'm striving, I'm pressing on. And over time, you will see progress in your life. You'll see how the Holy Spirit helps you. I mean, I can look back 10 years ago from where I was in 15 years ago, and be like, you know, I have made progress. Definitely not perfect. Far from it. But I see how the Lord is working in my life. I'd say one of the differences in my own relationship with God that that I'm seeing, I hate my sin. I hate it more and more. Where before it was like, ah, I messed up, you know, whatever. (laughs) Help me, Lord. Where now it's like, oh God, I don't want, I don't want anything in me that's not of you. Like, help me. Where I'm getting more frustrated, I'm getting more angry at it. And I look at that and I'm like, that's growth. I look at that and I'm like, that's maturity. Because someone who fears the Lord hates evil. And I'm learning to hate the evil that's inside of me all the more. And I can tell you, that's only happening by the grace of God in my life. Teaching me to do those things. So a follower of Christ has this mindset, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to keep pressing on, even if I've lost many battles before. So when we get to verse 17 in our, our text, our text today is 17 through 21, Paul says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. So what we see in verse 17 is that Paul is inviting people to join in imitating him. Now, you may look at that and be like, that sounds a little arrogant, Paul. Like, imitate you? But it's not arrogant. Why? Because Paul, he already said, I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. I'm still messing up. But what he's calling people to imitate him in 
is his example of pressing on after Christ where he does not stop. Where he wants to continue to know him, the power of his resurrection, sharing his sufferings and on these things. He says in verse 17, he says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. So keep your eyes open, pay attention. That keep your eyes open comes from that, the, the same Greek word he's mentioned before. I've mentioned it in, in, in our teaching through this, is skopio. Uh, like, like the, it comes from the Greek, it's like microscope, to focus in on, to observe, to contemplate, to observe and focus in on the walk of other people who are running after the prize. So we're supposed to set our eyes on Jesus. We're supposed to run after him. But what Paul is saying is, as believers, we're also supposed to be imitating other people who do this as well. We're like, well, is my head going to be going? Everyone's supposed to be looking at Jesus, but also looking at other people? No, because as we look at Jesus, as we're running towards him, we're going to see people ahead of us running in the exact same direction, where we're following the pattern of their life and saying, oh, I like how they follow after Christ. Oh, I, I see their pursuit after Jesus in their own life. I can learn from them in that area of their life. So that's the thing. We're, we're called to observe those who are walking continually after Jesus, where Paul says, according to the example that you have in us. Now, who's us? I'd argue Paul is saying when he says us, he's talking about him and Timothy, maybe Epiditus as well. People who are faithfully following after the Lord. He says that, he says that once again. He says, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. Now, the word example in the Greek, that word example in the Greek is typos. Um, as if Paul is saying, live in this type of way. Uh, he's saying, fit this kind of mold. Example can also mean mold. It can mean model. It can mean pattern. He's saying, I'm the model. Not perfect, but I'm the model of pressing on. You know, you think about when you're in elementary school and your teacher has a project for you to do. If your mind can go back that far. She's like, okay, we're going to do this art project. And the teacher had the night before worked on an art project herself or himself and puts it on the board. You remember as a kid, like looking at it and being like, wow, it's perfect. Well, how did my teacher do that? There's no way I can do that. But you look at it and you think, oh Lord, uh, or, or not back then I'd say, oh Lord, but you're, you, you're working on your project yourself while looking at what the teacher did. Well, that's what we do in our own relationship with God. We're looking to the examples, imitating other people and how they're following after Christ. Point number one on your notes, press on toward the goal by imitating faithful examples in their walk with Christ. To think through in your own relationship with God, who are those examples? Even think about this. Who are the faithful examples that you're imitating? Who are the people that you're, that you're looking after? It's good for us to keep in mind that our relationship with God is not a private matter some people say, I don't need church. I don't, I don't want to go to church. It's just between me and God. That's not what God lays out for us in his word. Uh, we're supposed to be learning from others in fellowship. We're, we're supposed to be imitating others, but we're also supposed to be teaching others. We want people to imitate us. Grant Osborne, uh, one of the authors of the commentaries I read, he said, the Christian life is a relay race in which we pass the baton to the next generation of imitators and, and teachers um, so we're passing the baton of faith to the, the, the people who are imitating us because one day they're going to teach the next people as well. So think about it. Who are you imitating in your life, in their pattern of, limi of living? Who are you teaching? Let's start with who your model is. Uh, we need models to follow. Uh, it's not just one person that's going to do it all perfectly. I think that's why Paul says in this passage, imitate me. And then he also says, imitate us. Uh, there's going to be multiple people that we learn from in our walk with Christ. And, and Paul's saying, imitate us. I mean, he's telling the Philippian church these things like, imitate us and putting people's needs first. You're seeing how we do this. Uh, imitate us and not grumbling. Don't grumble. Imitate us and rejoicing in the Lord in the midst of hardship. I mean, he's showing the church how to do this. Christianity is not just taught, it's caught. We're, we're, we're learning from other people and how they follow after the Lord. So whose example are you following? In regards to marriage, maybe you want a godly marriage. Well, what marriage are you looking at where you're like, oh, I want that kind of marriage. I love the way they treat each other. I love the way that they laugh. I love the way they go through hardship and cry together and mourn together. I love the way they serve in the church together. I mean, 
if you see a, a marriage that you enjoy here in the church, ask them to coffee. Hey, can we learn from you? Can we get together with you and just see um, what makes your marriage so special? We should be learning from each other. Same things in singleness, you know. Who's someone that, that's single and you're like, okay, I'm in a season of singleness myself. What can I learn from them as they're devoted to the Lord? What about raising your kids? I mean, to look at people who are, are raising their kids, like, wow, well, I actually like the way their kids are behaved. What are you guys doing? And for those who are parents, you know that we all have different kids, all different types of struggles, or maybe the struggles that you have with your kids, someone else in the church, they're struggling in the same way, but they're a step ahead, and you can learn from them and how they're parenting their, their kids. I'm pouring into your grandkids. What, what can you do? What can you learn? You know that we have a grandparent ministry here at the church that teaches grandparents how to pass the baton to their grandchildren to follow after the Lord? Even in dealing with, with death, um, every single one of us is going to experience death in our life. So to be able to see someone who has experienced that, to learn from them in their mourning and what they're going through, to help be faithful as we walk worthy in these times, uh, we see so many people in our church family who um, have lost loved ones. And even here today, I, I, I see the flies, Jeremy Fly and and Jess Fly, um, Jess, uh, Jeremy's our high school pastor, um, and Jess, his wife, uh, just lost uh, her mom uh, on Thursday. And uh, we've been praying for you guys. And next to you is, is Bobby, her, uh, her stepdad. Uh, we love you guys. I, I even see another guy in the room, Rodney, who, who just lost his wife as well um, and saw her right before she passed. I mean, it, it, that's the hard thing of, of being here in the church, of just seeing people who lose, who lose loved ones. And praise the Lord that right after that happens, you're here today, uh, pressing on uh, to follow the Lord faithfully. And there'll be people that God puts in your life to show you how, who've experienced that, and we're praying for you. And then you'll imitate that to other people as well as we experience that. Um, so just be praying for, for these families. Uh, we, we'll continue to, to pray for you, Rodney, Rodney, George, and also the Flies, um, and Bobby as well. Um, in developing a heart for the nations, I mean, how, how can we grow in developing a heart for the nations? I've told you this. If you're new to the church, I lived in South America for a year in Chile. The reason why I went there is because I did not have a heart for missions. I didn't. That's why I went. Um, because things come slow to me. Because I don't just want to read the Bible and be like, I know it. I want to love the Lord with everything that's inside of me. I want to love things the same way that he loves things. And that wasn't there. So I'm like, God, help me. That's why I went and asked the church, send me the best missionaries we have. They said, go to Chile. So I was like, okay. So if you don't have a heart for missions, you should. That's why we would really encourage you, walk through the back hallway, see all those unreached people groups. Feel overwhelmed as you see all the people who don't know the Lord yet. Come to the prayer night tonight if you can. Beg the Lord to give you a heart for the unreached. Say like, Lord, I need you in my life to, to follow someone's example in serving in the church or how to interact with unbelievers. Maybe you're like, I want to know how to interact with unbelievers, but I get awkward. I don't know how to bring up Jesus. Well, find someone who does it right. Learn from them. How do I pray better? How do I prioritize prayer? I mean, I'm just going to keep going through examples. If you're going to grow in your relationship with God, you got to learn from other people. You have to find examples that we rub, rub shoulders with. I'm like, oh, I like how you do that. Teach me. Teach me how. In reading, in reading God's word, how are you going to grow in God's word in approaching the scriptures where you have joy in reading it? Came across a quote by George Mueller. He was a Christian evangelist in the 1800s who cared for 10,024 orphans. That was his job. Can you imagine? My goodness. At the age of 71, he wrote this to younger believers he was pouring into. He said, now in brotherly love and affection, I'd give a few hints to my younger fellow believers as to the way in which to keep up spiritual enjoyment. It's absolutely needful in order that happiness in the Lord may continue, that the scriptures be regularly read. These are God's appointed means for the nourishment of the inner man. Consider it, ponder over it. Especially we should read regularly through the scriptures, consecutively, not pick out here and there a chapter. If we do, we remain spiritual dwarfs. I tell you so affectionately in kindness. I love you. <laughs> For the first four years after my conversion, I made no progress. For those of you who are new believers, I'd encourage you to listen to this part. He says, For the first four years of, after my conversion, I made no progress because I neglected the Bible. But when I regularly read on through the whole with reference to my own heart and soul, I directly made progress. 
Then my peace and joy continue more and more. Now I have been doing this for 47 years. I've read through the whole Bible about 100 times. And I always find it fresh when I begin again. Thus my peace and joy have increased more and more. When I read that, just another example to follow. Like, Lord, when I approach your word, whether I've read this passage a hundred times, oh, may I, may I find my happiness in you. May it refresh my heart in a, in, in a new way. What an example of a 71-year-old who was intentionally teaching younger believers how to approach the scriptures. There's examples all around us. You may have heard people say the best examples to follow are, are those of people who are dead. <laughs> you know, because you can like, okay, they lived it to the end. But there's great examples in our church. That's why it's so important to get connected to a small group, to interact with people, even people of different generations in our church. Who is it that you can learn from, that you respect? You're like, oh, I want to I wanna learn from you in this way. Please know this. We're not just supposed to be looking to other people, for example, but we're supposed to be an example. We want people to imitate us. Oh, what an honor if someone looked at you and said, I want to be like them. I want to love the Lord like them. I want a marriage like them. At this point in your relationship with God, would you be comfortable telling someone, imitate me, imitate me and how I do things, just like Paul said. A lot of times we tell our kids, uh, or a lot of times we tell our kids or those watching, do as I say, but not as I do. <laughs> you, know, you may have heard that saying before. Paul's saying, do as I do. Look at how I'm living my life. We should live in a way where people want to imitate us in our relationship with God and walking worthy of the gospel and that pattern of following after him. And we need to remember that our life is discipling someone in one way or another. Even if you don't have that mindset like imitate me, people are imitating you. If you have kids, your kids are going to imitate you and how you live your life. So the question is, how are you discipling those who are watching you? How are you discipling your kids? For some of you, you're discipling your kids just in how to have fun, how to drink too much on the weekends. They're watching you have another drink, kind of get a little tipsy. You know, they're, they're watching you have just fun and party. Um, you're really leading your kids to, well, to destruction. You're showing them what's important to you. Uh, while Christ is calling us not to show our kids how to party, but to show our kids how to impart to them the ways of following after Jesus. So here's the question. Are you parting or imparting? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a good thing to think through. What will your kids learn from you? What party are you taking your kids to? I think church is a party. You know, I really do. Come together, have a good time, worship the Lord, have fun encouraging one another. But what will your kids and those who watch you, what are they learning from you? And that's kind of what the passage goes on in regards to who we're imitating and the type of life, the good way of imitating Christ and the bad way. Look at verses 18 through 19. Here it says, for many, of, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So Paul gives a good example of who we should follow in verse 17. In 18 and 19, he's saying, don't, don't imitate these bad examples. Point number two in your notes, don't press on towards imitating those who walk as enemies of the cross. Don't pursue and go after those worldly uh, people who are pressing on after the things of the earth. Paul had apparently warned the church of these people before, uh, he was not bitter towards them. He actually says it with tears in his eyes. Uh, one commentator pointed out that this is the only time in Scripture that we're shown where Paul is, is crying, which is actually another thing that we can imitate Paul in. When someone's not walking worthy of the gospel of Christ or even enemies of the cross, he's not screaming and yelling at them. Uh, he mourns for them. Uh, he's, he's crying. He's hurt over it. It's hard to say who these enemies of the cross are. That, that's a big question in your mind because... As you read this text, I think at some point we're all going to think this question, am I an enemy of the cross? That went through my mind uh, when, I, when I was studying this. So who are the enemies of the cross? Some people would, would say it's the Judaizers, the ones that we talked about at Easter who kind of followed Christ, but they said you had to be circumcised too. We won't go into that again. <laughs> we spent enough time on that. 
Other people would argue it's believers and they were enemies of the cross that were falling away. Others would say it was unbelievers. Uh, most commentators believe that these enemies of the cross were within the church. They were inside of the community and that some, in, in some sense, uh, these people professed some type of belief in Christianity, but they lived in pursuit of earthly things. And that's what's scary, because there are people who profess that they follow Jesus, but then they have no fruit of it in their life, that they live a life completely opposed to the gospel. And those people are even in the church. So these enemies and deceivers, I would say, were pretenders. These enemies of the cross were deceivers. Their profession of Christ was not genuine. That's what's scary. There's people who profess Christ where it's not even genuine. And that's why Paul starts to describe, and he describes who these enemies of the cross are. It's why he says their end is their destruction. Because their faith wasn't genuine. If their faith was genuine and they'd given their life to the Lord, well, the Holy Spirit would hold on to them and sanctify them. But these people, eh, there was something else going on in their life. They claimed to know Christ, but they didn't. This is another description of these enemies of the cross. He says their God is their belly. It's like, oh man, they just like to eat. Okay, <laughs> you know, I guess they're just very large people. <laughs> well, that's not what it, that's, that's what, it's not, it doesn't mean that food controlled them. It's saying that God is their belly. It's really that they're, Selfish desires controlled them. That instead of serving Christ, they served their own appetites. They constantly just went after what they wanted. Once again, continue to think about this in your own life. Were you an enemy of the cross? Where you don't live to satisfy the Lord, you just go after everything that you desire in your life? You know, what they wanted constantly trumped what God wanted. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 talks a little bit more about this as we approach the end days. Paul says this, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Look at this part here. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Now, once again, when I read this, it scares me. I'm like, oh, Lord, I hope that's not me. Oh, Lord, I hope, I hope that's not me. Do I just have an appearance of godliness in, in my life? Is my heart fully sold out for you? Now, here's the thing. I think these passages, and there's many of these in Scripture, I think they make us evaluate the authenticity of our relationship with God. I think that's why they're here. Do I love God? Am I committed to God? Or am I just saying that I do and I'm going after everything that I want in my own life? You know, I see this with the Pharisees all throughout the scriptures. And this is why I question myself. I think it's good to question myself. The Pharisees taught the law. The Pharisees looked religious They looked clean on the outside, but inside they were dirty. They were greedy. It was all about them. So I live with this restlessness in my heart where I'm like, oh, Lord, help me never to be like that. I'm even asking myself, like, it's almost like I go back to my own salvation. It's my relationship with you genuine. This is where my mind goes, even in studying this. Okay, God, well, I do believe that you created this world. Okay, Lord, I do believe that I'm a sinner. I do believe that you sent your son Jesus to come and die on the cross for my sins and rise again. I believe that. I've surrendered my life to you, Lord. Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want with my life. Like, keep me. Hold on to me. Like, I I want you. I need you. And I remind myself, really, of the genuineness of of my faith, asking the Lord to show me anything inside of me that's hypocritical. Um... However, passages like these remind me that if I'm professing Jesus, yet going after what I want, I could be labeled as an enemy of the cross in that moment. I don't want to be labeled that. I I don't want that at all. Like I said, I know that I'm a follower of Jesus. I know. It's not like I'm up here like, is this guy questioning his salvation right now? In some sense, yes, I, I, I have many times just to make sure that it's genuine, and I don't think a lot of people at times will go there. 
But I can also tell you a reason why I know my salvation is secure. And it's in the next description here. I know it because I despise my sin. I told you that earlier. I hate my sin. Where these enemies of the cross here, look at this, uh, the next description point, they glory in their shame. It's like they're, they boast in the things that they do that are wrong. They boast and show off the very things that they're ashamed of. And you, I'm sure you've seen this with people before. It's like they highlight how drunk they got the weekend. I got wasted. <laughs> Isn't that great? Wasted. Love Jesus. Love him. Love him. It's like that doesn't add up. Or you have people who maybe they're living in sin, sleeping with each other before marriage, living together before marriage, just like no big deal, like no shame at all, where God says, don't come together as one until you're married. And not that anyone needs to feel guilty if you're in that here, but it's okay to, to be convicted. I'm like, man, is that me? Am I just okay with this? Am I glorying in that? Maybe you're in high school and you brag to other people about what you did with your girlfriend or, or your boyfriend and just like, yeah, this is where, where I'm at. Or you bragged at what took place at prom last weekend or you're bragging about revenge that you got on someone. Let me ask you, have you ever bragged and showed off something that you should have been ashamed of? I would probably say yes to that at some point in my life. I think all of us would say yes to that at some point in our life. Hopefully it was before we knew the Lord. But I think that's also a sign of where we're at in our relationship with God. Am I glorying in my shame or do I hate my sin and saying, Lord, save me from this? Oh, Lord, show me how to get out of this. Oh, Lord, lead me to be faithful in this. Where, like I said, a believer's not perfect, but the, a believer's walking worthy, pressing on to be more like Christ in their life. You can feel the Holy Spirit working inside of you. Where someone who's not a believer, their mind's set on earthly things. That's where Paul goes, like, they're just focused on the world. I'm going after the things of this world, pressing on towards the things of this earth. Uh, know this, everyone, every single person in this room is imitating somebody. Uh, in, 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 in your life, myself included, we're either imitating an example we saw who's pursuing after worldly things, or we're imitating someone's example who's pursuing after heavenly things. That's why this sermon is called Pressing On After Heaven or Earth. What are you pressing on after in your own life? Paul says this, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Look at me how I'm dying to myself and living for the Lord as I press on to find satisfaction in him and not satisfaction in this world. So what about you? Are you pressing on towards heaven or earth right now? Who are you imitating in your life? Are you a friend of the cross? Or are you an enemy of the cross at this point in time? Application questions, am I imitating those who walk worthy of the cross or am I imitating those who are enemies of the cross? Another question, in what areas of my life could I look like an enemy of the cross where I'm professing to know God but living in opposition of him? I think this is what the preaching of God's word does. It hits us in the heart and it's like, okay, I need to make an adjustment in my life. Okay, Lord, what do I need to change? Grant Osborne says those who claim to know but fail to live accordingly are enemies of the cross. And that makes my stomach sick because I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. And I don't want that for any of you. May the Lord help us to walk worthy of him. When we get to Philippians 20 through 21 in chapter 3. Paul uh, continues on. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. He says, But our citizenship's in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So Paul ends with a reminder of why we should live for heaven and not for earth. And he talks about our citizenship, about, about where we belong. Um, he says that we are citizens of heaven. And he uses the Greek word polituomai there, um, which you can see just even the political aspect of things. Uh, the people in Philippi, they were very proud of their uh, Roman citizenship, where Paul's saying, don't live as Roman citizens, live as citizens of heaven, for that's, that's what you are, that's where your homeland is. Even when we you look at our theme verse for this year, uh, Philippians 1.27, where it says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. If you remember me preaching on that back in October, the same word for citizen, Paul Atulamai, is, is in that part where it could be translated only behave as citizens of the gospel. 
So as we're imitating people, we either imitate people of this earth or we imitate people who are citizens of heaven. And Paul's saying, remember your citizenship of heaven. And, and he's really kind of asking people to consider, are you following an earthly pattern or a heavenly pattern? There is a mold and an example that we are imitating. Are you pressing on after heaven or are you pressing on after, after earth? A uh, little illustration here. My buddy Jeff's going to help me, help me out. Uh, I saw this illustration like 20 years ago. If you remember Francis Chan, uh, he did this in a sermon, and I, I'm choosing, choosing to do it now because it's stuck in my mind. He takes this rope here, and Jeff's going to unwind it and go out that, that door where we can't even see him anymore. We'll make it really tight, and we're even going to go over people's heads, Jeff, if that's all right. For those who are there, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> You'll never forget this. <laughs> Jeff, don't hit him. Oh, no. Oh, don't hit the baby, of course. Okay, well, let's go right there. All right. <laughs> we'll go this way because I don't want to be over her head. <laughs> All right. But here in this rope, can you see this? Can you see this red tape? Can you see that? This represents, this red tape represents earth. And so many of us, we have our mindsets set on this little part and how we spend our time and how we go through hardship. It's like our heart is only focused on the red. Where the white, this represents eternity. I mean, it just keeps on going where Jeff's outside the door and we can't even see him anymore. So really, just even to have this mindset, are you living for something that's so temporary putting all of your energy, your time, everything just into this, or are you living with eternity in mind? That's a very important thing. All right, Jeff, you can come back in the room. <laughs> come over your head. <laughs> I think it's a very important thing for all of us to consider in our lives. What occupies your heart more, earth or heaven? Point three in your notes, press on towards walking as citizens in your homeland. Press on to walking as citizens of your homeland. I chose homeland because we need to consider what is your homeland? Well, what do you consider your home? The earth is not our home. Heaven is our home. First Peter talks about this, that we are aliens and strangers in this world. So what we view as our homeland will influence the way we live our lives. C.S. Lewis said this in Mere Christianity. If you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. So we're constantly thinking about heaven. How can I live? How can I die to myself? Because heaven is for eternity. And as Christians, we know our citizenships in heaven. And that's why we prioritize God's commands. That's why we prioritize his laws. It's why we prioritize his privileges of saying, Lord, help my mind to be set on what's to come, to live for that. And we know as the verse continues on that our Savior is there, that he'll come back to us and he'll come and bring us back to heaven and he'll transform our lowly bodies like his glorious body, our broken, weak, humble, sinful bodies will be perfected one day by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. If Jesus can subject all things to himself, uh, he can transform our bodies and make them perfect. He can help us today. So as we close, let me ask you this. What does it look like for you to press on in your own relationship with God today? What does that look like? We're going to take communion in just a second, but think, think through this. What does it look like for you to press on after Christ? It may mean for you to walk worthy, take that next step. For some of you that are struggling, it may mean to crawl. Like you just need to crawl worthy, just like you see someone running a race and they fall down on the ground and they're just crawling to the finish line. I mean, just to move forward. Maybe it's you humbly acknowledging today in communion that you're not there yet. And like, God, I need your help. Help me, Lord. Maybe it's identifying some area in your life where you've been walking as an enemy of the cross and saying, you know what, Lord, you've put this on my heart. And this needs, this needs to change. Help me to walk worthy of you today. Maybe you need to simply remind yourself of God's power. 
and just that how he's going to enable us for our bodies to be transformed when we die, that his power can help you today, strengthen you to fight that good fight in the midst of the sin that you're wrestling with and saying, Lord, I need your, I need your help. So would you just take a moment, uh, we'll just take a moment to, to be still before the Lord and ask him, God, how can I press on in my own context of life? Um, how can I follow after you right now? And then we'll take communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 24, Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread and even remember how Jesus Christ pressed on for us, that we would press on for him. In verse 25, it says, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take that together. After service today, as we close, um, we have our offerings if the Lord leads you to give. We have our benevolence offering, uh, remembering those who are hurting in our church. If you have a couple of dollars, want to put that in, it, it goes to even help people who just need help pressing on, and our church uh, supports them. Um, let's pray as the worship team comes out. We'll sing one more song together. Father, we come before you and we give you praise. Uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, help us to press on in our own relationship with you. Help us not to be stagnant, not to stop, but to take that next step in our own context. And we know, Lord, that your power will enable us to do that. We look to your son, Jesus, as an example, Lord, who pressed on towards the cross to follow you. So Jesus, help us to press on. Help us to press on, to strive after you. We need your help. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord together. sing this together. God, you see me.
sing that chorus one more time together. What a blessing it has been today, this morning, worshiping with you all. If you are new to The Grove, we would love to connect with you. So please head on over to Guest Central so we can get to know you. Um, if you are in need of prayer today, please come on up to the front. We will have prayer partners who would love to pray with you. And if you have a desire to give, there are giving boxes right outside the doors. Have a great rest of the weekend, and we'll see you all next week.